into my work. Um, I am a performance coach and per se plyometric um, geek. I run a business that is primarily based on plyometric training programs and education for coaches and athletes at large. And I was asked to to join the summit and to deliver on plyometrics and dynamic movement. And then I thought, you know what, this is my chance to really feed in some of my system thinking. And today we're going to be digging into using a full spectrum of movements when it comes to dynamic and plyometric training and how a large spectrum of work can feed ultimate athleticism. So a focus, kind of section of focus points for today is how exposure to the entire spectrum can improve biomechanics and health. So that might be tissue health, it might be joint health, um, it can be a whole host of things, but ultimately it's about improving the way that we move to improve outputs and also minimize um, injuries as best as we can. Um, and, and just improve overall health of how we then continue to move kind of, I, I always say this, but for the rest of our lives and looking at health longevity. We'll be looking at using certain ends of the spectrum for improving learning capacities. And then we'll be looking at using a spectrum to determine exercise selection and programming. So that is the a, a roundabout way of explaining some of the topics. It won't necessarily feed kind of perfectly one section by another, but it gives you a general overview of that stuff. So when I kind of tasked to put together a spectrum, I thought that, I mean, you know, I've seen other forms of dynamic movement spectrums, and I think they always need to be a kind of two axis kind of spectrum of things. Um, you can kind of look at it as a quadrant or we'll use it and, and term it like segmental components of the spectrum. But here we are looking at how force has a relationship with the stiffness or depth of a movement. You might have seen it where they have uh, the ground contact times in the X axis and that's compared to levels of force. And you could really do something similar here, um, and it probably would fit in a similar way, but we're gonna be looking at more deep and uh, deep or yielded based, based actions versus stiff and overcoming based actions. Ultimately, I think it's gonna be more stiff and then comparing that with deeper actions. And then we're looking at high force versus low force. And what that gives us is a divide of where Output or high levels of intent are in the top two sections, top left and top right. And then we have reflexive actions in the bottom left and bottom right. So how might we segment some of this work and where do we get the understanding of where each of those segments may fit? So if we're looking at, we'll start with the top right segment because it's easy to understand most of us know and have seen high levels of intent coming from a stiff overcoming action. So this movement might be, let's say a pogo leap that's you know termed in the industry or a leap for as much height as possible on two feet. And you are looking to maintain a stiff position as possible. You don't want to, uh, to deform around the joints. You want to really bounce off the floor as effectively as possible and use that energy to propel you into the air. So we've got our real stiff overcoming intent-based movements in the top right section. In the top left section, we have intent, but at depth. Now it does say yielding here, so that there is a little conflict to how you might look at that spectrum, but I think it just, just enables you to understand it a little bit more conceptually, but you might see a deeper range of motion where you're still trying to pump yourself into the air, but you'll drop into a much like deeper depth. Um, let's say it's in a split stance, and then you'll try to just rebound out of the bottom of that as hard as you can and get as much height off the back end of that. So there we have intent at depth. 
And then if we to look at the bottom right, we still relative we are well we are in the stiff zone of or stiff segment, but lower force levels. So everyone in the industry, I think, it is using a a form of a pogo action, um, and this can be just a a stiff, light, reflexive action where you might be able to complete a high level of volume of this sort of stuff, um, and ultimately maintain decent levels of uh, of stiffness throughout the joint. So you're, again, you're not compressing too much around the major joints, and you are just popping off the ground with little effort. Really, that's a really important component to that. And in the bottom left, you have reflexive yielding actions. Reflexive yielding meaning movements at depth again, and you might drop into that action, but it, but the intent out of it isn't a highly demand a highly demanding part of the action. So you're looking to just maybe bounce in and out of those nicer deep ranges of motion. Of motion. Sorry, I can't can't talk. Um, and you're looking to just bounce in and out of that, maintaining good depth, but keeping the rhythm element there as well. So what's meant by reflexive segments? You know, reflex or reflexive movement is might be thrown around quite a lot. So we're going to look at it here. So those bottom two segments, um, we're going to term landings and takeoffs that happen in a highly relaxed state that rely on flinch like pop out of movements. So if you're doing, let's say in the bottom right, you've got some some light, really extensive base movements, you maintain a good level of stiffness, and you're just bouncing on the spot. This stuff doesn't require high levels of effort. There's no, you're not gritting your teeth to really get out of this movement, because you're able to relax and just bounce and allow our soft tissue to do a lot of the output reflexive work for us. The other side then might be something a little deeper, but you're getting a reflexive action out of the bottom of that movement. So in the blue here, it says whether in a taller or deeper range of motion, the landing and takeoff sequence has a large contribution from passive tissue reflexes and not the active pursuit of muscular effort. So if you're actively trying in what you think are more reflexive based movements or in these reflexive segments, as we're terming it today, it might be the, if there's, if there's, if there's an active pursuit to try in it, it's probably maybe a bit too intense. It may need to come down in terms of how much, how much airtime and displacement you're getting out of each takeoff, calm that down, just relax in it maintain either the stiffness or the depth depending on what your outcome goal of that is but if it's if you really are trying it's probably not extensive enough a bit too intense so what do these segments look like and what do they train if we're to look here this is the reflexive yielding section you can see that right here we're teaching the body how to yield and to yield is to accept a level of force it's to take it upon us to be able to deal with a little bit of overload and allow our joints to deform and then ultimately obviously we will get back into a, some form of an overcoming strategy at some point because you know, not everything that we do can be completely yielded Otherwise, we would just fall flat to the floor. But here we are looking to allow our body to get into deeper ranges under some form of overload. And that here is gravity, or whatever it is, in the body weight. This is a absolute gold mine for, for tendon health. Um, I had a great conversation with Jake Tura who's an expert on tendons and he was speaking to me about the the value of kind of middle ground extensive work um, that, that you know that's not too intense and not you know completely extensive and almost not dynamic but this stuff has a middle ground of there still is an element of, of force at a relatively fast rate it's not completely static and slow like an isometric 
but it's great for tendon health in certain parts of the tendon. And what we have here as well is a high rate of intermittent muscle activation. So within this sequence, we're seeing that relaxed bounce in and out of that motion. And what we get is that switching on and off, that intermittent muscle activation, which we want to see, because if we are to be constantly turned on and overly, overtly kind of co-contracting to kind of, oh, we've got to deal with this massive force that we're about to receive, the likelihood is that we're never going to get into reflexive um, actions because we just won't allow ourselves to just find a little bit of depth where we get that. So teaching the body to flick on and off that muscle activation, flick it on when we really need that to be, you know, is of high importance to us, but ultimately learning as well that there needs to be a state of relaxation at a given point within a movement sequence. Obviously that's normally within the air, um, and then how that is then transferred into when we're coming in to strike the ground. We also just, we just build a, a, a comfortable um, kind of, I guess it's a, a breakdown of an inhibition to be comfortable at depth. So we're teaching, obviously we're teaching the body how to yield, but certain people, maybe whether it's a mobility issue, whether it's a having some form of inhibition because of an issue maybe with a knee that you had before. Maybe, you, maybe you've been through a, a patella tendinopathy and you don't want to drop that shin forward so much that you get high levels of flexion. Well, with these sorts of extensive levels of, of movement, we are able to get into that depth and just work in it and oscillate in it. Small landing and takeoff based action to it, but we can find you know, a certain level of comfort and just work within that range. So that's our reflexive yielded section. Here we have the re reflexive stiff section. And within this we are, you know, we're open to a massive potential for learning skills that transfer to intent-based activities. And it's not to say that you can also get that in the reflexive yielded one as well, because you can, but obviously a lot more of the movements that we do are obviously very specific to being pretty stiff on the ground and how we work more in a, in a reactive sense. What this does as well, because it's very extensive in nature, we're able to use a high volume, which again provides us with a stimulus where the tendon is constantly going through. It's not being you know, pulled to, to death. It is just being flexed in a nice rhythmical manner. And you can build up a high volume in which the tendon then develops either greater cross-sectional area, thickness, um, and that I think allows you to step forward as well into high levels of intent-based movement as well. And it gives you that level of preparation there as well. What comes off the back of this ultimately is landing and takeoff skills and building a much higher level of precision with how you attack the floor. That's a really important thing when it comes to intent-based movement is if you don't have the ability to be precise with your active pursuit to strike the ground, you can, you can either lead yourself down a road of injury you can mistime things and, and timing is that second point there as well. And that automatically just destroys output, rhythm, fluidity, and how everything grooves one movement to the next. So that is our reflexive stiff segment. What's meant by intent and the intent segment? So these segments have an active pursuit of intent and outcome goal. So if you've been wondering, like, what do, what do you what do you mean by that? Well, it could be it could be a movement, it could be a a bound for height, or a hop for distance, and the intent and output with these segment segments place enormous stress on the tissue in both taller and deeper ranges. So ultimately, you are you are stressing the muscular tendinous unit to its max 
when it comes to using movements of intent, especially when there are a full landing and takeoff sequence to it. If you're just doing a static jumping action, like a counter movement jump or a squat jump, the stress is not going to be anywhere near as high as if you were to do repetitive leaps for height on the spot. Or if you were to do repetitive split exchanging leaps on the spot for height, but you are dropping right into the deepest parts of the range that you can handle. The stress on the on the muscles there and the pull around those joints is enormous. Obviously, it's a, a massive part of pushing the athlete past the demands of their sport and how that really feeds into a, I'd say, an output reserve when they return back to their sport. So what do these segments look like? Well, our intent-based segment at depth, it shows you high eccentric stress on the tissue through exposure to force at depth. So you can see here, massive eccentric loading portion, really long, and then a big transfer through out the other side. Really important part to this is controlling posture under prolonged periods of force. So if there are ever any movements that you see in an athlete where they come in to cut or change direction, if they completely, and a cut and change of direction is obviously a much deeper, when you, when you have to change the direction of your momentum, 99% of the time when it comes to a, a cut laterally or you're just decelerating, changing direction and going the opposite direction, then you're normally in a much deeper range in comparison to if you were just trajecting yourself forward, like sprinting or bounding for distance or something. So you'll find that some guys will, let's say that they're coming in to decelerate, they put the brakes on and they just lose posture completely. Um, and if you're able to use movements like this to control your posture for longer periods, then it has a massive transfer into this stuff. We're also looking at going beyond the demands of sport in terms of joint torque. So we have an enormous amount of joint torque when we're doing these sorts of movements purely based on, you know, you're taking that joint through a long range of flexion and extension, and you're throwing a lot of force into that. So intent with stiffness, you're looking at a rapid transfer of force. So your, re your rate of eccentric loading is enormously fast. And because of this, because it's such a short period of time that your body's under that force, you're exposing the body to the highest levels of forces. And that provides a maximal muscular tenderness unit output or exposure. So here, here is actually three of the plus pliers tiers. So we have our light tier down here. So within the plus pliers system, we do have a structure of four tiers and I will, I will get onto the missing link part of that. But we have, I term them the light tier, which is in the bottom right, which is our stiff or reflexive stiff movements. Our intent stiff movements is what I class as ping tier. You're looking to ping off the ground with as much um, height as you possibly can. So you can see here, it's a real pop off the floor. And then you have deep tier, which is split into two. So you have deep tier overcoming where I'm going for as much height as possible, but also loading it pretty deep. And then the deep yielding tier, I'm just doing some oscillatory kind of low ceiling leaps here. So you can see that breakdown of those three tiers. There's obviously the split of the, the deeper work, but that is actually how I organize all of my plyometric training um, and how, how I program and how that then leads on to lots of learning and growth and development over prolonged periods of time. Now, with the addition of bridging the light and the ping tier, I have a sub-maximal tier, which I, I class as the medium tier. And the medium tier is, is kind of exactly as it says, it's kind of in between that light and ping tier work. Um, and that, as I said, is a, is a sub-maximal exposure to work. It's not, um, it's not completely, you know, max intent, but there is also high stiffness, 
and relative levels of force there. So you're kind of creeping into intent there, but it's not maximal intent. And what, what I like as well here is, you know, you, you could, you can create tiers yourself, or you can look at tiers within say plus plus system. And ultimately, you know, those, those tiers are a pinpoint part of each of those segments. You might have a large tier of movement kind of surrounded by this circle where the stiffest stuff might be, might be bilateral movement and the bilateral stiff stuff actually might be maybe a little bit higher on the segment. Whereas, you know, it could be another form of movement, which could be a little bit less of force, or it could be a little bit more towards slight more yield in how you do things. And that goes exactly the same for each one of these tiers. And it, and it depends on where and what you're doing, the direction of movement that you're doing. And ultimately, this is a great way to create movement selection and actually say, like, what, what is this movement? What does it look like in regards of stiffness? How does it look in regards to force? So I can have a stiff movement, but it can be really high force. It can be, you know, in, in the middle, and it also can be very low level force. And I can also have the same for deeper yielded base actions. So you can place any movement onto this. You can say, okay, well, you know, when I do medium tier bounding, but I'm actually, you know, normally it would be kind of more up here because it's relatively fast, relatively stiff. There's quite a bit of force to it. Hopping might be even higher than that, closer to ping tier. But if you were to do lateral bounding, you're probably going to spend a little bit more time on the ground. So that might move over and it might drop down because you're spending longer time on the ground. It's more towards a, a deeper range of motion. And it also probably then drops off in terms of the level of force. So you can straight away make a lot of decisions based on what adaptations you think are going to come from the movements based on where you're placing them on this spectrum. And then to further that, I've just put here, you can place sports on this spectrum to guide programming. So what you could have is you could have, if you go back to here, you could have a large segment that's kind of massively, you know, you could color in it a large segment of, you know what, we are working with Olymp Olympic weightlifters. Well, they do a ton of deep overcoming work, a lot of, or maybe, maybe they do, or maybe they don't do a lot of deep yielded stuff. They do a little bit of light to stuff, but the likelihood for us to creep into the stiffer high force stuff maybe isn't there. Maybe it's kind of the reason why, you know, you're missing out on something. Maybe you're seeing other people that are using more stiffer, high forced work. And that is a reason why maybe you're missing out on certain adaptations that you would like. So this is something that I think is really valuable to use as well to say, cool, I can look at this spectrum and I can scatter loads of movements on here, or I can look at where my sport is and figure out ways in which I can improve the programming that I'm doing because I'm missing out on X, Y, and Z. Awesome. So this here is how we're going to look at using a complete spectrum to improve biomechanics and the get, I've put the gate cycle in here because I've been using a lot of the gate cycle recently. I think there are some fantastic brains out there that are discussing the gate cycle and how that can really help to uncover quite a few issues that you might see, um, within, you know, injuries or just within movement quality and what you're trying to get out of it and especially even even from an output perspective so our first part here is looking at too much of one thing not necessarily being great so going back to discussing the the part on you know where your sport may fit now, if I was to be maybe a little critical of something like the jumps community, I was a high jumper, I was a, a jumps coach, so I can kind of, I can, I can kind of say my, my part here. But what you see a lot of is everyone wants to work in the intent stiff area, or they, they might do a little bit in 
the reflexive part as well, but mostly down the stiff end of the spectrum. That's what our sport looks like. So therefore, that's how we have to train it. And what you find is you find, I've put equals a lot of opathies. You find a lot of tendon issues. You find a lot of fine bone issues in the foot. You get a lot of overuse injuries. You might see stress fractures where the body just does not like to do too much of one thing. It likes to have different amplitudes, rhythms, time under force, rate of force, and a directional bias that might, then your body just might enjoy working in different directions. And I think this provides a large impact on joint health, skeletal health, and being able to spend more time training and improving the way that you're competing over a longer period of time. So a little thing here is, so we're using a, a more of an overcoming action here, but you can see, you can watch me access pronation here. You can see my foot change shape as I go through supination into, pro, uh, into pronation. So if you watch this left foot here, you can see as that foot moves really well because the shin is dropping forward nicely and I'm allowing myself to move through that gait cycle. So what that does is it allows me to spend more time in max propulsion. I'm getting comfortable with spending time in an area where I'm exposed to the most force. And what that does is it says to me that I can go away and find that in other movements. Another example of this might be loading early stance into max propulsion rapidly. So it's a, it is a lightning fast transfer from when you first touch down to when you're in mid stance, excuse me. So, this initial loading action, this initial loading action, you can see just how fast and how quickly that rate of eccentric loading is. Now, what a lot of people might find difficult is actually allowing yourself to get into max propulsion here. So it might be that you, you try too much to stay stiff. So my shins do drop forward a little bit here my knee travels forward a little bit. But what that does is it provides me that access into max propulsion. And from there, I get this reflex out of the ankle, out of the tissue that crosses the ankle, and ultimately provides me with the pop out of that motion. So what we're ultimately, ultimately looking to do is to have full access to the gait cycle. And that in turn is going to provide greater access to those reflexive mechanisms that I mentioned. We want the body, obviously in, in certain instances when it comes to when it comes to stiffer, more highly dynamic and reactive movement. If you watch here, obviously I want to maintain as much stiffness as possible, but I've got to move over the foot effectively to get that that second half of the portions pop. So you can see, so there'll be a popping action out of the hip and the ankle now. And you see that propels me into the air. And it's because I've been able to move through that gait cycle effectively. And what we see here is that when we have, so when we have limited mobility to access important segments of gait, doesn't just reduce the reflexive output, but what it does is it potentially leads to an offloading of those output duties. So you know, I've worked with many a people before where let's say that there is a chronic mobility issue or, you know, they, they freeze up and they try to fight the body yielding into a certain, you know, plane of, of action, whether that is to travel the shin forward and allow the individual to get into more max propulsive stages, 
Well, what that does is, unfortunately, when you've got an experienced individual, they might stiffen up in a certain area, but then their body thinks, well, I still need this output. I still need for you to provide an enormous amount of force here. So I search for it elsewhere. Let's say that you are, you're kind of inhibiting the amount that your knee, your knee travels forward and you get into max propulsion. And what that does is it offloads into something like the Achilles and the Achilles then has to try and provide so much more and you, and you work in more of like an ankle dominant strategy to try to achieve the same displacement that you were getting before. It works for a little bit, but believe me, chronically, it starts to really take its toll and demand on the on the Achilles or, you know, lower leg. And it comes back to bite you. It really does. And ultimately, it's one of the number one reasons why you might see an overuse injury is because of the lack of capacity to get in and out of quality movement. So that is why, as I say, we move into this component is that relaxed reflexive movements are where learning starts and develops. So we are allowing the body to learn to get into those, you know, depths or allows the body to yield enough to get a reflexive pop out of it. An important point at the top there is that movement that's too intense creates really difficult scenarios for improving landing skills. Um, and so if you chase that constant need for, you know, faster, uh, faster, higher, more, more output, I'm constantly chasing to, you know, touch that point on a backboard if I'm a basketball player, um, or, or that difference between, you, you might have two different types of people. You have someone that goes out to train and they work on all of these learning capacities and you have someone that goes to practice and they go and practice the thing all the time and, and don't understand why not doing all of the work around it enables us to get access to higher qualities of reflexive performance. So some of the, the landing skills um, that you're just, you're not going to be able to develop at the same level as, as if you were to have a larger spectrum of movement and variety are that pre-activation coming in, you know, just before you hit the ground, turning everything on in an instance and being prepared to stiffen around a joint really well. Proprioceptive awareness. So understanding where you are in space, being able to build a high volume of work so that nothing feels particularly new to you. You've done this, your body is subconsciously flowing in and out of motion and you feel comfortable in dealing with all different types of movement. And then the postural control on top of that is understanding where your body is in space, dealing with that orientation of force and modulating how that kind of propels you into the air and what your posture then does with that force. The, the, the reflexive segments as well, um, they really allow for um, an initial conscious skill development. I think it's really difficult to to segment the idea of taking upon us kind of two sides of a cue. So one cue, if you're doing, let's say you're doing max intent based movement, let's say you're trying to jump for as much height as possible, but then at the same time, you're trying to work on, on landing skills, you're trying to work on a certain biomechanical, you know, process or a sequence of movements, whatever it might be, it's really difficult to have that intent in the back of your mind, but also a skill to work on at the forefront. And what the what the more reflexive portions allow you to do is they allow that to become more of a conscious effort at first, um, which then can kind of be, it can then become more subconscious. So ultimately you you then get to more of the intent based movements and all of this stuff is subconscious anyway there might be a con, like a configuration kind of period where you're consolidating what how that is to transfer to more output um, and to higher intent but ultimately that that's a quite a short process in doing so um 
and that last point as well is if you look at look at the the movement on the right hand side it's just learning to yield teaches you, you like you don't have to fight force but you can use it for reflexive contribution so ultimately we use the reflexive segments of movement to improve skills for the intent segments so using only intent based movement leaves a lot of potential for learning to happen and has a diminishing return on investment. I always kind of use the phrase, but if you keep knocking on the door of harder, 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 faster, 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 it eventually comes back to bite you. As I mentioned before, it could be a whole host of things that, that really come back to you, but ultimately you aren't training the, the skills to unlock those kind of higher levels of performance. Okay, so the final part of this is, I wanna show you just, just a quick way of looking at how you can go away and program across the entire spectrum. Um, now I understand that there are many components to this, but this is just a, just a really simple look at different program outlays um, and how how that might move and undulate throughout the year. So I always, I always throw this, um, this image in, but there's like an ideal basic to program. Um, and, and that would be to kind of lift on a Monday, do all my plows on a Tuesday, lift on a Wednesday and rest, and then repeat that. And ultimately it might not be conducive to higher levels of learning and it might not breed a, it might not breed the best kind of sequencing for you to get more of an exposure over the entire week, whether when it's more condensed into maybe two sessions a week, then you have a lot more fatigue that is a larger knock on effect. And I think when you're trying to learn whether it's landing skills, whether it's movement patterns, then having a larger exposure to them sorry, a higher frequency of exposure day to day to day, I think allows much more of a, a chronic learning effect rather than it being like, oh, I did really well on Tuesday. And then when it comes to Friday, I kind of got to relearn what I did Tuesday. Whereas if I can go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, that's awesome because I'm not leaving too much time in between that small learning period and stimulus. So, this might be a specific way to look at a learning focus. So, so on a Monday, we, we might go for a high volume of working on the learning specific segments where we might use some light stiffer stuff and some deep yielded stuff. And that then can pass on to then, you know, it can move then into a highly neural day on the second, uh, on the on the Tuesday, um, and and that's just to make sure that you're keeping in the intent based stuff. I think if you shy too away, too far away from any segment, I think that you're leaving certain things unturned. So I like to make sure that you're exposed to every tier or every segment every week of every year. Even the smallest little dose can go a long way. So if we have that high volume day on a Monday, we might have a small stimulus of more really neurally demanding stuff. So that's where we're getting in the stiff overcoming stuff in our ping tier and then the deep overcoming stuff in our deep tier. And then you might then look at doing something like a transfer of skill days where you're trying to up that. So you're going to work on some skill development in the light tier movements, and then you're going to try and find them in the medium tier. Can you can you maintain a relaxed state when you when you go from light tier bounding into medium tier bounding? If so, this is a this is a great way to tease that over. And then in you know six months time, that transfer day, you might you might be working a tiny little bit in the light tier, but the medium and ping tier become a predominant part of that. And the highly neural day, you might cut that up a bit differently. And then you could have like a lower day of stimulus, maybe let's say on a couple of days after the transfer day, 
and that's just about consol consolidating some some volume of work that you want to keep in there for just some general tendon development um, and and just some eccentric landing capacity work. Now, this is something that you might look at if you were if you were trying to build more sport specific based learning in there as well. Um, and this is something that I, I will show most people when it comes to, to developing a, a program and structure. But I like to I like to pair the, the stiffer based actions higher up that level of force uh, and keep that specific to the sports that they're doing. So the example that I use is being someone like a long jumper, for example. And Monday we use as like a basic primer. And the Tuesday then becomes about there's some small learning periods here where you've got some light and some deep, let's say probably a deep yielded action. But the sport specific stuff and the, the higher stiffer amplitude work is actually in some sprinting and long jumping. And you can then kind of match up maybe keeping in light tier throughout the week, even on just general strength days, but keeping when the, when the days are highly neural, you're also still doing a consolidation of skill learning there as well. And you can pair that either side of the really stiff stuff that you're doing. Here too is a, is an awesome example of how you would undulate those segments or tiers if you're looking at it from a plus pliers lens, but let's say the GPE is so, or Bondarchuk's method of, of classification is the general prep exercises. And those general prep exercises might actually be seen as more of the learning component segments where you've got light and deep reflexive actions. Then the specific um, prep exercises are kind of that in between. They're that medium tier, submaximal movement. And then the specific development exercises would be the stiff um, ping stuff. Um, and it could be, depending on what, what you do, there could be a deep element to that overcoming work as well. But what this shows you is that within certain periods, so let's say that we are doing a high level of, um, of learning and using a high volume of learning segments at the beginning of an off season, well, the, the, the specific real overcoming stiff stuff might be much lower. And then as that grows, the learning side drops, but it never completely leaves. And the specific prep, prep stuff is kind of always humming away in there. It's not the whole program. It's not a tiny segment of the program, but it's always at a certain level throughout that program. And having that mix of, 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 uh, of tiers and different learning capacities um, and outputs can swing up and down as much as you like. It can swing from year to year. It can swing season to season, or it can swing, um, you know, microcycle to microcycle, depending on how you want to look at it. And ultimately, like that is where your speciality comes in. And you can you just pair it the same way that you would pair all the rest of your training components, because I think it's still it's still very similar, and it still is served in the same way. And that ultimately is how you can piece together this stuff seeing where do i where do i get the most time to work on learning developing how i'm eventually going to want this to transfer into more intent based actions and ultimately seeing that these learning segments don't just feed the intent based segments when it comes to tissue resiliency they are developing our skill capacities to deliver a higher level of force in a more accurate and quality way. So I hope that you guys have been able to just see some of these points in terms of how you might look at, it, at an entire spectrum of movement and how that really can deliver in terms of the the quality of work that you can do season to season and how that can continually develop. I want everyone to understand that there doesn't really need to be a point where there's a diminishing return to what they're doing. I, and it really saddens me to see someone that's kind of, let's say that they're a long jumper or a high jumper, but they've kind of long jumped themselves, like full approach long jump themselves kind of out of, 
being able to improve what they're doing. It's just this constant, let's just push harder, 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 harder. And it ultimately it stagnates very quickly and you lose the ability to access maybe something that you're working on in, in other places. Let's say that you've gained new strength in the gym. Let's say that you've been working on more speed, but you can't deliver any of it because you're not necessarily working on an entire spectrum of deeper actions that are less in force, maybe stiffer and higher levels of force, depending on what sport that you do. So hopefully you can go back to this spectrum, place your sport on there or sports that you work within, place a focus on where certain movements that you coach fit within this spectrum and just play with it. Play with how you can undulate your training and ultimately get the best out of your athletes. So I want to thank you for listening to this. Um, it's been a it's been a really good chance for me to really portray some of the stuff that I think is going to lead athletes to becoming more and more athletic. If you want to reach out to me and check out my uh, training and plyometrics that I deliver, you can go to pluspliers.com. We have everything from complete beginner programs to return to sport programs and we deliver it on every single level possible, complete beginners all the way through to elite athletes. You can also follow me on Instagram at McInnes Watson and learn tons about pliers.